Good morning. Welcome to Trinity this morning. We're so glad all of you are here and those that are worshiping at home. Uh, thank you for coming this beautiful morning, and we hope you walk away with God's presence today. And now for our call to worship. Please stand for the call to worship. Called to be branches in Christ's body. called to be mustard bushes offering shade to God's creatures. Called to be growing with God in the midst of this world's painful questions. Please remain standing for the first song. pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Today's first scripture reading comes from 1 Samuel 15, verses 34 through 16 and 13. Then Samuel left for Ramah, but Saul went up to his home in Gibeah of Saul. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him. And the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? since I have rejected him as king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jess of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jess to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jess and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. 
The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jess called Abinadab and called him and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Just then had Shammah pass by. But Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Just had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jess, Are these all, of your, all the sons you have? This is still the youngest, Jess answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. Our next reading is a responsive reading, Psalm 20. It is up there. So it's a, you can look on page 789 in, in the blue hymnal, or you can follow up here. The response you'll see is listed between each of the verses that we'll say. We'll repeat that response. So together, God of our life, through all the circling years, we trust in thee. So we'll continue reading together. All the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your victory and in the name of God, set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. God of our life, through all the circling years, we trust in thee. Now I know that the Lord will help his anointed. He will answer from him his holy heaven with mighty victories by his right hand. Some take pride in chariots and some in horses. But our pride is in the name of the Lord our God. They will collapse and fall, but we shall rise and stand upright. Give victory to the King, O Lord. Answer us when we call. God of our life, through all the circling years, we trust in thee. Our last reading this morning is from Mark 4, verses 26 through 34. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scattered seeds on the ground, night and day. Whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. Know how. All by itself the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. Thanks be to God. seated. One pastoral prayer can't possibly cover everything, 
and it certainly doesn't cover every day of the week, so I hope that in addition to the names that you see listed in the prayer concerns, you will be praying for Boaz Johnson as he comes to serve as minister for the time being and for the church council as they make important decisions in the days to come, as well as for our president and others at the G7 summit that they may make wise and just decisions. Let's come before God in prayer. We thank you, God, for bringing us safely through another week. We thank you that so many of us have been fully vaccinated and no longer have to wear masks all the time. We're so grateful that we can see one another's faces, that we can sing your praise unimpeded, that we have been delivered from the scourge that has covered the earth. We thank you for the blessings of this life, for health and strength and the means to come here this morning, for the joy of knowing brothers and sisters in Christ who are gathered in your name in other churches, for all people who love and serve you and witness to your Son, we give you thanks and praise. Hear our prayers for those in leadership, in this church, for Boaz Johnson as he assumes leadership. We pray for the leaders of the denomination that they may make good decisions that serve and glorify you, that are pleasing to you and carry out your mission. We pray for difficult decisions that may lie ahead for them. And we lift up the world leaders at the G7 summit and those who are not present at that summit, making decisions that will affect virtually the whole planet. Lord, help us to put aside selfish interest. Help us to show love for one another and for your creation in all that we do, in our words, in our actions, and in our votes. We pray for those known to us who have special needs, for the Erickson and Eigenbauer family in their grief, for Ron, for Deborah and David, for Barbara, Shirley, Rita's family, Carol, Grace and Harry, Susie, Jason, and those whom we name before you in our hearts. We lift up those concerns that we carry silently within us, those that we have not shared with others, that we are afraid or ashamed or hesitant for any reason to let another help bear our burdens. Lord, hear our prayers. Let your spirit make intercession for us. Strengthen us for your service. Fill our mouths with your praise and your word and your message. Fill our hands with tasks that bless those around us and give glory to your son, Jesus Christ. In all things, Lord Christ, let your name be praised. For we ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.
Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I want to thank you for this invitation to come and worship with you and preach the word yet another time. It's a privilege to be here at Trinity Covenant Church, a community that has nurtured and supported my family and me in so many ways for so many years. From today's sermon title and a story I want to tell you, you may be thinking, well, yeah, but Father's Day is next Sunday. Nevertheless, I want to share with you something that happened with my dad that I think provides a framework for thinking about today's Old Testament reading. Some of you may know that before I came to North Park Theological Seminary, I taught at Duke Divinity School for several years, and that's in Durham, North Carolina. It was there that I bought my first home a raised ranch house built in 1953. Now, in that part of the state, basements are the exception, not the rule. I had my washer and dryer in the kitchen, which fortunately was big enough to accommodate them, but the furnace and all the plumbing and electrical lines ran underneath the house in a crawl space about four feet high. I was so happy to have my own place that was really mine, and things were going just fine until one day when I came home from work and heard water running. I checked the faucets in the bathroom and in the kitchen, and everything was turned off. Well, the line that ran to the washing machine underneath the house had given way. I knew enough to go into the crawl space and creep over to turn off the supply, but then what? Keep in mind, this was before we had the internet. There were no YouTube instructional videos on how to fix this. So I did the only sensible thing. I called my dad in Chicago and said, what do I do now? When I told him, that the line running to the washing machine was a very long and very dilapidated hose. I could just picture him shaking his head and thinking, oh no. Of course I was short of cash at the time. I had just bought a house and I was making car payments too and I thought, oh, professional plumber, I can't afford this. Well, my dad, God bless him, talked me through the entire repair job over the phone, step by step. It was a crash course in PVC, cement, elbow fittings, pipe cutters, all of it. He was so patient. And trust me, this was not a quick process. I phoned him every time I got confused or frustrated, and I was filthy from all the time I was spending in that crawl space. But thanks to his instruction, the project was a, a finally finished, problem solved. About 10 years ago, I had the opportunity to go back in that house. No, I didn't go in the crawl space. But when I went into the kitchen, I saw the PVC pipes and the faucets that I had installed were still there and presumably still working. It was a very satisfying moment. <laughs> Things could have gone differently. Imagine how this story would have ended if halfway through the conversation, I'd said, that's fine, Dad, I got this, and ignored his instructions. Or if I listened to everything he said, but then went from one hardware store to another, getting different opinions on what should be done and no doubt spending a lot more money. Or if I had heeded my neighbor who said, hey, I know a guy, he's not a licensed plumber, but he's pretty handy, I bet he could fix it for you cheap. 
Any of these alternatives would not have resulted in a happy ending. But I believed my dad knew what he was talking about. He was trustworthy. He had never steered me wrong before or given me bad instruction. Even though I had plenty of misgivings about what I had to do, I was sure that Father knew best. Today's reading from the Old Testament is a Father Knows Best story from a thousand years before Christ. Now, I understand you have had guest preachers for several months now, and visiting speakers often don't follow the suggested readings from the Revised Common Lectionary, so this narrative about the anointing of David may be coming to you out of the blue. So let me give you a little bit of background to the story, if you don't know it, and refresh your memory if you do. There are three main characters here, Samuel, Saul, and David. But I'm going to focus on the first two. So let's begin with Samuel. He was a prophet and a priest and a judge. In fact, he had a school for prophets at Ramah, a little bit north of Jerusalem. You may remember that before he was born, his mother, Hannah, dedicated him to the service of the Lord. And his most famous line in the Bible was spoken when he was still a child. Lord, speak, for your servant heareth. God spoke to him in the night. And the mission to which God called him was to organize the kingdom of Israel. Up until then, they were just a collection of tribes and cities, and there was widespread corruption and conflicts. That was the norm, even among the priests in the temple. You may remember that the last line of the book of Judges is, in those days there was no king in Israel. Each man did what was right in his own eyes. Well, the people wanted a king for their survival, if not to reform them. And so God directed Samuel to anoint Saul as their monarch. Anointing someone with oil is what you did back then. It was part of the ritual that set you apart as a king or as a priest or other offices. The Bible says that Saul was tall, dark, and handsome, as well as being very religious. And he got off to a swell start in his reign by defeating the Amalekites, one of Israel's enemies. But then he began to slip up. He made three big mistakes. His first mistake was offering sacrifices. Only priests were allowed to do that, and Saul wasn't a priest. Then he told his army, we're going to abstain from food before the next battle, and anybody who doesn't is going to be executed. This resulted in a ridiculous death sentence for his son Jonathan, who hadn't heard that order. Fortunately, the sentence wasn't carried out. And the third thing Saul did was he did not follow God's order to destroy all of the Amalekites and all of their possessions. Instead, he kept the good stuff and let their king, Agag, live. Now, to our contemporary ears, some of these may not strike us as such a big deal. But Isaiah the prophet reminds us, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, says the Lord. God had instructed him through Samuel, but Saul thought that he knew better. So God told Samuel he was rejecting Saul as king and ordered Samuel to go to Bethlehem to anoint another person to take his place. Samuel argued with God about this. It didn't make sense to him. How can I go? If Saul hears about this, he'll kill me, and I wouldn't blame him. The Lord gave him a cover story. He said, take a heifer with you, and if anybody asks, say you're there to make sacrifice. And remember, Samuel was a priest, so that was legitimate action for him. 
And when he encountered Jesse, he invited the man and his sons to go with him. His real purpose, of course, was to anoint one of them to become the next king. So Jesse's offspring all arrived, and Samuel took a look at Eliab, the eldest, and thought, great. He's mature, he seems intelligent, he's ready for the job. God said no. Jesse brought forth the next son, Abinadab. And Samuel stood there sizing him up with the cruise of oil in hand, and God said, no. 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 Seven times God said no. Probably exasperated by now, Samuel said, hey, Jesse, you got any more kids? And Jesse said, well, yeah, there's the baby of the family, but he's off tending the sheep. He fetched the boy, whose name was David, and God said, this is the one. Anoint him. Samuel did what God commanded, and when he anointed David, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily from that day forward. That's as far as the text goes today, but you can see we are presented with contrasting ways of responding to God's commands. Samuel, Saul, and David were all loved by God. The name David even means beloved. There was a divine purpose to everything that God commanded them to do, a purpose they did not fully understand. Now, Samuel questioned the Lord's instruction and suggested alternative courses of action his thinking, it's dangerous to anoint someone else while Saul is still in power. You know, and, and I think Eliab or maybe Abinadab would make a fine kin. But in the last analysis, Samuel trusted God and obeyed. Samuel never saw King Saul again. He returned to Ramah, and his name is scarcely mentioned in the Bible until one verse at the end of chapter 25 that says he died. Believing that his heavenly father knew best did not result in riches or prestige or whatever version of happily ever after we might imagine for him. But Samuel had unbroken fellowship with his Lord, and more important, he had a part to play in God's good purpose that was and is still being revealed. Saul, on the other hand, had a very promising beginning within God's will until he decided to go his own way. Like David, he was chosen by God and anointed by Samuel. Like David, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him when he was anointed. The Bible says Saul was given the gift of prophecy like Samuel. He was blessed with sons and daughters, and with God's help, he prevailed against the Amalekites. But at a point that suited him, Saul followed his own reasoning rather than God's instruction. He rationalized his own desires, and his thinking may have gone something like this. Worship is a good thing, isn't it? And Samuel hasn't returned here as I expected, so I'll go ahead and make sacrifice instead, even though I'm not a priest. Fasting, that's, that's a time-honored discipline. Moses fasted for 40 days on Mount Horeb. The Jews were told to fast on the Day of Atonement. Joshua and the elders fasted. Why not have everyone in my army do the same? I know the order was to destroy the Amalekites and everything they owned, but take a look at this prime livestock. Be ashamed to waste all these sheep and oxen, and I can use them for sacrifice. Why not take King Agag captive instead of killing him and make an example of him to others? It all made sense to Saul. But Samuel replied, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice 
as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. We're told in chapter 15 that Saul repented of his disobedience. He was so desperate for forgiveness that when Samuel turned away from him, he grabbed onto the hem of his robe until it tore. Oh, he was very sorry for what he'd done. But that didn't eliminate the consequences of his actions. If I had ignored my dad's words to me, of course he would have forgiven me, but my crawl space would still be flooded and I'd have a whopping big water bill. The narratives of Samuel and Saul are actually stories about God, our heavenly father, knowing best. Even when his children have different ideas about the best, most sensible, most advantageous course of action. I often find myself torn between these two characters and the way they responded to God's directives. Maybe you do too. I want to live a godly, righteous, sober life, to borrow a phrase from the Book of Common Prayer, but the temptation to go my own way, trust my own judgment, rationalize my words and actions is very strong. Is it that way for you too? We, we may tell ourselves, for example, well, I know this is not exactly right, but these are extenuating circumstances. The end justifies the means. You do what's right for you. It's your choice. Compared to what everyone else is doing, and of course, love is love. All of these, and no doubt you could add to the list, are sentiments that substitute human limitation for divine direction. They reflect the reasoning of a modern day Saul. We don't have Samuel in our midst to advise us today. I don't have my dad. And I think you'll agree that it can be very hard to discern which modern prophet, if any, is delivering a message to be trusted. But we have something even better. As the author of Hebrews reminds us, in many and various ways God spoke of old to our fathers, the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by a son. We have Jesus Christ, the living word, as our savior, and as an example of perfect obedience to the Father. And we have the written and divinely inspired word to instruct and guide us. The gospel reading has the image of a sower spreading seeds, not knowing or understanding how it will spread or flourish. In the same way, if we submit to God's will as revealed in scripture, even when we don't know why this is his will or what the result will be, he's able to bring about a harvest within us and around us. After all, it's his harvest, his kingdom, his story. When other voices in the world are encouraging us to follow our own impulses, to rely on fallible human judgment, the voice that we can trust speaks to us through scripture and through fellow believers who hearken to God's instructions. When we're tempted to minimize our own responsibility or push forward agendas without the guidance of the Holy Spirit, God's word offers us a course correction. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. I don't know if you are at crossroads this morning as individuals, 
or as a household or as a congregation. But I am confident that whatever you are facing, our Heavenly Father knows best. Call on him. He loves you and is always willing to help. Ask him your questions and make your case without making excuses or prettying up your circumstances. And then listen, trust, and obey. Amen. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Holy God, you call us to live in mystery, to walk by faith, yet we long for plans and goals and schedules. It's hard to live by faith. You want us to place our trust in you, to live according to your direction, yet we want life to make sense from a human point of view. It's hard to live by faith. You call us to feel the mystery of life, to marvel at the power of your love. Yet it's not easy to accept your promise that everything has passed or passed away. It's hard to live by faith. Forgive us, holy maker of reality. Forgive us for playing God instead of accepting our humanity. Fear not, for our Creator, the loving Maker of all reality, forgives us and redeems us from violence and oppression. 
God sows the good news in tiny seeds, inviting us to tend the soil of community and marvel as they grow. In the name of Jesus, who is the Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Now is our time to pass the peace. We welcome all who come here with peace as Christ welcomed everyone, no matter what their background, no matter your social status, as Christ welcomed enemies and friends, outcasts and leaders, foreigners and neighbors. Let us open our hearts and our homes and our lives. Let us be the Christ to everyone we meet. Now is our time that we pass the peace of Christ with a wave a hello, a kiss, blow a kiss to those of you at home. <laughs> the peace of Christ be with all of you. Sorry, just checking on some info. <laughs> all right. Um, we welcome, uh, we're so glad all of you are here today, those of you worshiping, worshiping with us at home. Um, if this is your first time here, we'd like to get to know you better. There are some get to know you cards in the pews. If you'd fill that out, um, we'd greatly appreciate that. Same with at home. If you want to go online, um, we have a connect card at trinityecc.org that you can fill out online. It would be great if all of you would do that. Um, we see some new faces. Well, new, should I say old new faces here today. Lots of rains here today. Welcome. <laughs> Um, Carol, we thank you. We know you always say you have such a great connection to Trinity, but we also welcome you as Trinity's family, so we're so glad you're here. Um, Dr. Boaz Johnson's next, uh, as Carol mentioned earlier, his first week is next week, um, so it's very exciting. Um, we will have a coffee hour, after, well, not hour, maybe a coffee half hour, I don't know, whatever it, it turns out to be, it is Father's Day, so a lot of you probably have plans, but please plan to attend and, you know, greet him and get to know him a little bit next week after church, so it's real exciting news. He met with... Um, the church boards last Tuesday. He'll be meeting with the exec board this Tuesday. Um, just real exciting and can't wait to see what comes in the next few weeks and months and year. So very exciting. Um, on a different note, there are limes and bread in the fellowship hall if you are interested in limes and bread. <laughs> That's all we got today? Okay, limes and bread. So I don't know what you can do with that. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Okay, well, if you have any questions or concerns, um, please come and ask us, anybody on the exec board. We will try to answer any question that you have. So now moving on to our offering. This is our point where you can give money through your tithes and offerings to Trinity. Um, this enabled us, enables us to grow the work of God's kingdom. We uh, many of you are so diligent with giving your offering, and summer gets a little, sometimes we travel in the summer, so there are many ways that I will mention that you can give um, to Trinity even while you're away. We want to give to help what God is doing in our church and through our church, and we see lots of new things will be coming in, in, in the next few months, so please continue to um, give through your tithes and offerings. There are three ways that you can do this. You can drop your tithes and offerings in the box at the back of the church. You can um, give online at the trinityecc.org slash give. That is the, the quick, easy way. I think I've been doing that for about two, three years now, and I don't even have to think about it. It just comes out, and there it is. Or, of course, you can mail in your tithes and offerings to the church. So, thank you.
Lord, we pray that you will accept the gifts that we give online or through the mail or in the box at the church, but help us to present ourselves as well as a living offering to you. Take all of us, take our intellect, our hearts, our hands, and use them for your good purpose through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.